This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Today on the show, I have Dominic Frisbee. He describes himself as an accidental financial bod, comedian, actor of unrecognized genius, voice of many things, and a presenter. His new book is Life After the State. I can't remember who exactly told me that I had to talk to Dominic, but I checked him out online. I think I saw an interview with him and Max Kaiser, and I was like, ooh, Dominic's got something to say. So I thought it'd be a cool conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Michael. Yes, Dominic. How are you doing? I'm well. Good. I'm well. Now, let me just uh, play with my volume button. Um, now, how does this sound? You sound good. Excellent, because I'm using an iPhone, so, so technology is working. Well, I'm on a, I'm on a MacBook Air. Uh, sometimes I've used iPhones for sure. Yeah, it's awesome. Okay, great, great. So, listen, you know, my big my big question is this: is that you know I'm I'm very somber these days. I don't want the state to end. I, I I love the state, Dominic. I love the bear hug of government. I want more of it. I want it surgically implanted in me. Please don't <laughs> take my state away from me. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't is that even, is that even an that. opening question? I'm not even sure, but I don't want my state to go away, Dominic. I don't think you're any. I don't think you're in any great danger of losing it. <laughs> um, so listen, you've got an interesting background, and I, I know you, you're you're quite open about it. You're like, you, I, did you start as a comedian, or did was it just something along the way, part of the journey, or? Um, no, I started at, well, it's, it's a long story. Are we actually, are we recording now? Are we on? Oh, absolutely. Oh. We're not live. So I'll make sure that if you say anything weird, you make, you know, you, you say something unusual, you talk about, you know, something you shouldn't say about your girlfriend, or your wife, we'll cut all that, but. Uh, okay. Uh, fine. I didn't realize, I didn't realize we were actually recording. Okay. So that's no problem. Um, so, uh, I, I, um, I actually started out, I went to drama school and trained as an actor. And, uh, but I was always the kind of the funny one in the class, if you like. And, um, very soon after that, uh, um, I wrote a song, a comedy rap, and I tried to get it released as a single. And a friend of mine said to me, uh, I, I knew a friend of mine who was a music agent and I spoke to him. And he turned around and said, no, 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 what you want to do is go and perform this at my brother's club. And um, I didn't know this, but this turned out to be one of the roughest stand-up comedy clubs in an area of southeast London uh, called Deptford. And I went and performed it there, and everyone was getting booed and having, you know, tomatoes thrown at them. And uh, I went on and did my song, and it, it went really well. And um, as a result, the 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 owner of the club gave me a booking and then phoned up all the other clubs in southeast london and said you've got to book this guy and suddenly i had all these dates in my diary and i, I was a stand up comedian and uh from there i i you know this was when i was in my late 20s and when i was in when i came into my late 30s it was there that i started getting interested in interested in money and how systems work and uh, the evil machinations of the state well so you know i i'm sure there's some people that are thinking well uh they're, they're saying to themselves well mike covell uh you have dominic on your your podcast and you know he he, he a comedian by training and uh but what what could a comedian tell us how could he possibly have the expertise to talk to us about uh, the state and economics, et cetera, et cetera? But those same people would ignore the fact that Ben Bernanke was running the Fed in 2005 and 2006 and, and apparently didn't see any problems. So I frankly think we, we, as a society, we've got it all messed up. It doesn't make a difference what someone does. It makes a difference what they know. Uh, well, you're absolutely right. And the short answer to your question is I'm not qualified to talk about those things. I don't have a degree in economics. I'm entirely self-taught. But one thing that comedy does do is you, very, you find very quickly if the audience don't understand, they don't laugh. And that's, and, and so it's essential that they understand. And that 
forces the discipline the discipline of clarity onto the comedian now what i've found in all the books on economics and finance that i've read that same discipline doesn't exist in fact a lot of the time uh, the authors are very lazy in their use of language and so there they there's a lot of uh, scope for obfuscation and um in fact often it suits people who talk about economics and finance particularly if they're spokespeople for the government to actually be vague and wishy-washy a lot of the time i've watched old videos of alan greenspan and you know what's he talking about half the time so in a funny kind of way even though i'm not qualified that very discipline of of clarity means that i think i write about a lot of these issues uh in a much clearer way than than so than people who are qualified to do that. Can, can I pull a Jerry Seinfeld on you for a second and just make an observation? You're saying you're not qualified, and I'm just thinking to myself, well, what's the definition of qualification? Because the folks that have been running this stuff that so-called have the qualifications don't know what they're doing. Well, that that uh, that certainly appears to be the case. Um, and uh, one of the great crimes is that the people that took us into the great crisis of 2008 are the people who are <laughs> taking us out of it. And they didn't understand it before. And I'm still not entirely sure they understand it now. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 very sad. And the other issue is, is that economics is taught as though it's an exact science. And uh, it's not. And a lot of the people, a lot of the scope of the way that economics is taught is it's dominated by certain schools of 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 economics and there are other schools that aren't taught in universities that maybe have just as much validity as those that are taught but it means that those who leave university and so on with economics qualifications there's a bias there there's just there's just a, a structural bias towards certain schools of economics let me let me establish something for the audience too we're talking about your new book life after the state and you make some fairly strong statements out of the gate. And just to give people an idea of where you're coming from, you talk about, hey, look, institutions, social arrangements, economic policies, political ideas, it's all breaking down. And you ultimately say, hey, look, government, less is the solution. And the best thing for government to do is nothing. As I, as I lay that predicate, I want to kind of get into one example because I think I can share with you some of my experience from last year living in Asia. And I was wondering if you could talk about your example and it's early in the book of unintended consequences and specifically your Cuba example and frankly, ladies. Yeah, the, 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 the Cuba example. I mean, I don't know what, um, well, let me backtrack a bit. I, I went to Cuba when I was a young man and, and I used to love Latin America. I went all around Latin America and you had this bizarre situation in Cuba where, um, the, you had these two currencies. You had the, the dollar and you had the Cuban peso. And officially, the exchange rate it was one to one. But in the real world, the exchange rate was 20 to one in the, on the black market on the street. It was impossible to find an exchange rate of one to one. And all Cubans were employed by the government and they were paid in Cuban pesos. But you couldn't buy anything with Cuban pesos. There was nothing available to buy. And if you wanted to buy Western goods, you know, a pair of jeans or a, uh, a beer or uh, some nice meat, you would have to go into the dollar supermarkets and you would have to use US dollars. And it was impossible for locals to get US dollars unless they came into contact with a tourist in some way. And so you had this bizarre situation where everyone, rather than wanting their children to be doctors or engineers or something useful, all they wanted their children to be was either waiters, taxi drivers, or prostitutes, because that was the way that you got dollars. And it was such a desperate situation that you had, you know, a, a, a pretty young girl could earn in a night with a tourist you know, she might earn, I don't know, $100, $200, $500, whatever she would earn. But that would be more than, a, I, I was staying with a professor of economics when I was out there, and that would be often $100 was more than he earned in two months. Uh, and in some cases, so you had a situation where if she had a good night, a, a prostitute could more, more uh, earn more than a professor earns in a year. And you, so you had this incredibly distorted um society and the professor actually said to me one time we were we were sitting um 
uh, on the on the seafront in Havana, and we were just watching the world go by. And he said to me that Castro has actually created this situation where every because of the fact that it's the only way they can get money, Castro has created this situation where every Cuban father wants his daughter to be a hooker. And you know. I don't know what the, the, the intention behind Castro's great revolution was in the 1950s. It might have been political ideology or simply to overthrow Batista. And then he allied himself with the Soviet Union um, as a means of standing up to the USA. He might have been forced into that. And, you know, I don't know if he was a genuine communist or, or what his ideology was. But surely the intention behind the great Cuban revolution wasn't that every Cuban father would want his daughter to be a hooker. And so that was kind of an early experience of, of how, uh, state action and, and state policy has these terrible unintended consequences. And I think your, your larger point there is not to say that it's necessarily going to unfold the same way in Western economies. Oh, no, I don't think it is. No, I'm not suggesting we're going to that situation, no. <laughs> On the flip side, let's be perfectly frank, having traveled all of Asia last year, um, that, that, uh, that unfortunate underbelly is a big part of Asia. And, and Asia has a lot of capitalism going on, and they have a lot of opportunities, but still, uh, the, the unfortunate part uh, still rears its ugly head. So, I, I, But I think your, your larger issue is like, look, the more state takes over, the more the tentacles get involved, uh, the more unfortunate, unintended things can happen. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, I, I mean, we have a situation now in London where I live where – the average first time buyer of a ha of not even a house of a flat or was an apartment as you as you guys would call it is now over 40 and that's not his first house that's his first apartment and the majority over 50% of people under the age of 30 believe they will never own a house because house prices have become so ridiculously expensive and the reason that they've become expensive is that artificially low interest rates for five years have meant that a correction in housing that should have happened in 2008 never happened. People have been able to, um, you know, those who are in debt have been able to carry on paying their mortgages without a single problem. And those who saved have just seen the purchasing power of their money evaporate. And in, in terms relative to housing and We've got this situation of low interest rates because they, uh, in inverted commas, wanted to keep the system going. But all low interest rates do is penalize labor and reward capital. And so, you know, low interest rates have actually exacerbated the wealth gap to unbelievable levels. And I'm sure governments just, they, all they wanted to do was get the economy going again. They didn't, their intention wasn't to create a wealth gap, you, you know, but that's what they've done. And I'm sure every every sensible politician would much rather that young people could afford a house. Let me ask you this, Dominic. So as you're as you're in this topic, you've jumped into it. You know, you've jumped right in the deep end with your book, and you're right there taking on all the issues that, frankly, as as I might affectionately say, any good libertarian is going to see and observe and say, "Look, less state is more." But have you noticed any pushback? Because I've noticed in my world that when I address these issues, I invariably get some people that are even friends and acquaintances and they say, well, this is too negative of a conversation. Just be quiet. Don't talk about these things. And, and, and the trust, the trust in the state is, is, is frankly to me is, is terrifying that these people feel like, well, don't, don't talk about it. It'll, it'll all just get solved magically in some dark black room with politicians. And, and there's the idea of criticizing, criticizing for some people, uh, they get upset by this. Well, they do. And um, one of the, I'll give you an example is, is, you know, a lot of people in, in, the, in the UK believe that if we didn't have a state to look after, uh, you know, our health or our education or to look after the poor and needy, then the poor and needy wouldn't be looked after. There's this common assumption. Now, I actually argue that with no state, the poor and needy would be better looked after at a lower cost. But people won't accept that. They just think, well, the poor and needy will, will suffer, and therefore we must have a state. And anyone 
because of this assumption, anyone who suggests that we that 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 we mustn't have a state is is also saying that the poor and needy shouldn't be looked after. Now, of course, they're not saying that at all, but that's how people interpret it. And therefore, you're deemed heartless and cruel if you don't believe in the state model. And the actual weird consequence, if you like, the weird thing is that the the, the left-wing pro-large welfare state, uh, people who believe in that, actually have a monopoly on compassion because of this belief that if you don't believe in the large state model, you don't believe in helping the, the, the poor and needy, when that's just not the case at all. But um, so that's one one example, if you like. Um, but yes, people, yeah, people do, they do. I mean, I, I'm just trying to gauge people. I've, it, it, uh, of the people who've read the book, I'd say I get, you know, of every 10 emails I receive, I'll have maybe seven or eight going, you know, I really liked it. I've bought loads of copies for all my family. This is exactly what I think. And then I get two that are just horrible. I mean, really, really so nasty. They kind of leave you with a sick feeling in your stomach. And, and you know, the, the only thing you can do is just delete them. Um, but, but uh, you know, it, it's, it's an issue that really divides people. It makes you wonder about their state of mind when you get some of those ones that are so off the wall. You're kind of like, wow, is that really part of our society today? And it, and it really is. Well, and you kind of go, if, if, if we were in the same room together, you wouldn't talk to me like that. Right, right. So why are you, why are you sending me mess? Why are you taking the trouble to go out of your way to say such hurtful things? But, um, you know, that's just, that's one of the uh, beasts that the uh, that is the internet you know that's just one of the beasts that you have to deal with let me get into a couple specifics uh, there's so many different topics that you're addressing in your book i just want to get into a handful here but i think one of the things that i was thinking about as i was reading and you address this is that and i don't know if most people think about this these days and because i i know as, a, as somebody will be selling a house here in the not too distant future a certain portion of the proceeds of my house will now go to the new healthcare system in america how that tra- yeah. how that transaction was figured out i'm not sure but I, I was also watching the first godfather the other day and i was thinking as i was reading your book i was like you know every transaction the government takes a slice and vito Cor- yeah. vito corleone could only be so proud of a trans every transaction having the state take a piece of it and it's become so overwhelming and so all-encompassing it's almost like people have just kind of given up and like oh yeah it's completely normal for the state to take a chunk and it just goes to someplace special where special people make decisions to dole it out to other special people it's crazy it is crazy and we're totally desensitized to it and uh you know you've earned the, the money you've earned you've paid tax on uh, the money you've earned is is the issuance of government. Then you uh, you have a transaction with somebody else. There is a transaction tax, and then the the money that the other person receives there is tax payable on that. And at the same time, the uh, purchasing power of the money that you've used is stealthily being eroded by inflation. And so, I mean, there is just so many simple taxes. You know, it is not voluntary. And when when money is coerced like that, it, it's just, it is, you know, it is extortion. And what I find so awful about taxation is you are given no choice, bar a vote of dubious impact every five years, in how your money is spent. Now, a lot of your taxes, you know, I don't agree with the wars in the Middle East. I don't agree, you know, a, a lot of Americans might not agree with the fact that you have the military. And I said 150 different countries in the world, you have army bases now. And, you know, a lot of Americans might not agree with that. And yet, you know, the your labor is going towards the funding of that. And so when money is taken from you and spent on things that you are morally opposed to, I think you have a very, well, I mean, that's a, an insidious system, really. Listen, here's where I here's where I want to go on another issue that something I'm kind of combining a couple thoughts that you have in your book. First off, let's just take the idea of greed is good 
And, and this is some, yeah. this is this can cause a lot of people a lot of headaches. And you you I don't know if you are referencing the Wall Street film, but you mentioned uh, Dr. Walter Williams in there. So I want you to kind of oh, yeah. I want you to tie that in, but then also tie it back in with the famous line from uh, Francisco de Acuna's speech in Atlas Shrugged: uh, "Money's the uh, root of all evil." Really? Well, then what is the root of money? And I, why don't you take those topics? The uh, Greed is good. Money is the root of all evil. And then the idea of the poor and try and combine that for the audience where they can understand that being greedy, being selfish, uh, and that money are not bad things. And it, and, and having a desire for those things doesn't, uh, doesn't make you, as, as you were saying earlier in our, our, our conversation here, doesn't make you anti, uh, people that are, that don't have as much or people that are downtrodden. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the system that which you operate. But if you have a truly capitalist, capitalist system, then greed is good because true capitalism rewards productivity rather than predation, predation. Um, so, but if we don't have a true capitalist system, we have a crony capitalist system, and that is a system that unfortunately rewards predation as much as it rewards productivity. Do me a favor, define crony capitalism for the audience. Uh, that is an, uh, 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 one of the most difficult things to define in the whole world. But a capitalist system would be a system where, I mean, it's pretty close to anarchy, really. There's, there's, well, let, let me let me backtrack a bit because I think people will understand what crony capitalism means by w what I'm about to say. Go for it. So, if if you are greedy in a capitalist system where pretty much everything is voluntary, um, so for example, I want to be the funniest. I would I, I I want to be the funniest comedian in the world. Now, if I become the funniest comedian in the world, and you know, I make. Uh, lots of funny films and I write funny books and I do funny stand-up shows and I bring joy and laughter to millions, then I am acting in my own self-interest because I want to bring joy and laughter to millions and I want to be the funniest comedian in the world. But in doing that, in acting in my own self-interest, I bring benefit to others. Now, that's a, that's a simple capitalist system. Now, you know, the guy doesn't go out and, and sweep the road in the morning because he wants to help you. He does that because he's getting paid to sweep the road, so he is acting in his own self-interest. So in that sense, greed is good. But when you have a system whereby, for example, uh, you know, you have a heavily, heavily regulated system and you want to go and buy a house, but in the course of buying a house, you have to pay a, a lawyer 5% and you have to pay a, a tax man 10% and a this and that. Those five, that 10%, they're all... You know, all, all those guys, the lawyer who's, who's playing the legal system or the, the tax man, that is a form of predation. That's not productivity. It's predation. And, um, a crony capitalist system is a system which, uh, is, is heavily regulated, which is that there's no, free market operating uh where where special interest groups benefit so for example you know say i'm an act i i get art subsidy from the theater um i'll i instead of concentrating on producing good plays uh instead i concentrate on lobbying the government to give more subsidy to the arts so you know that's a me exploiting my own special interest and you know I, I, I lobbying both in the uk and the united states lobbying plays a huge part in what decisions get made what regulation gets made what legislation gets made what subsidies are given and so on and i, I think i'm right in saying that it's widely agreed that lobbyists have too much influence and all they're trying to do is game the system have rules made that suit their special interest rather than so that they get a little bit of money from the government or a little bit of favorable legislation from the government rather than genuinely being productive themselves. I hope I've explained that. <laughs> yeah, let, let me throw an example out and see if this if, is if you're on the same page with me, if you agree with me. Could, could we say an example of crony capitalism is the fact that Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley and General Motors still exist as firms? Well, yeah, they were all bailed out. 
and it, that's exactly what crony i mean you know and the 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 monopoly on money which the banks have is i mean money is really a duopoly governments and banks both issue money banks create it through the issuance of debt and governments you know print it and use quantitative easing and various other means but they both have this duopoly on money and you know, when you have control of money, and people wonder why banking and finance has grown so disproportionately large, and why the state has grown disproportionately large, well, it's because they've got this duopoly on money. And take that away, if they actually had to do productive things, uh, instead of creating money out of nothing, and then charging interest on something that didn't previously exist, you know, the, the the financial sector would be a lot smaller. And so, yeah, I mean, Goldman Sachs, General Motors, uh, it's, they're all, they're all uh, beneficiaries of, of crony capitalism. And, you know, we've got this unfortunate world now where, you know, the way to earn money is to, to, to benefit from state largesse in some kind of way. And, but if you look at the genuinely productive areas, it's things like Google and Apple and all the tech startups. That's where America's been very strong in the last 10 or 15 or 20 years. And, you know, but these are all areas that, you know, they were able to do all these things because it was a, it was a new world. The cyberspace was a new world that was, you know, uninhabited <laughs> by, uh, by the state. So they were able to operate and develop without the barriers to exchange that, that the state creates. Let me, let me, sh let me shift gears into a, a topic that's all within this sphere. And that's the topic of education. First, let me ask you though, yeah. cause I, I noticed one of the chapter headings in your, in your book. So let me ask, uh, are you a Roger Waters fan? <laughs> well, uh, we, I was trying to think of a good uh, title check for that section and and that's that song came to mind you know we don't need no education and um but i mean you know the education syllabus it, it, it's it's relevant to a different era it's it's no longer relevant to the world in which we live today and yet because education is largely but you know supplied by state the syllabus hardly changes and uh you know how many how often do people say well I to do everything i learned at school was just a way of passing five or ten years or 15 years of my life but it, it, you know i never really learned anything until i started working and you know experience is the great teacher not schools in my opinion and uh, uh i mean have you been an independent entrepreneur essentially how long have you been kind of this independent entrepreneur Oh, I've, I've only ever worked for somebody. I mean, I, I do jobs for other people all the time, but I've been what we call a freelancer ever since I left college. I, I once had a, I had a three month job at an office and I went absolutely insane and I hated it. See, I'm, I'm, I'm at about over 15 years. I've, I've never really worked for anybody. I mean, after I got out of school, I wasted the time in school and then I got out and the internet started. But I, I think maybe that's underestimated in this day and age, in an age where there is so much uh, government, so much crony capitalism, and you still got people that are, you know, I watched a little bit of uh, the American president last night talking and, you know, it was all about oh, yeah. all about how he's going to create jobs and, and it's going to help the dignity of people. And I'm thinking to myself, this is all like, you know, you know, it, it becomes like a black comedy frankly but i think this idea well the thing is you know all the all the big pronouncements we you know we I, they want i want a society where people are richer i want a society uh where everyone has a house i want a society that's this that and the other which is equal but all those things that politicians say you know we all want that but the it's the the reason the thing is is that is that it's it's the means and you know the the so whether it's Obama or Bush or Cameron, whoever it is, Orlando, you know, they've all got their, their own ideas about how to achieve this, this great goal of, you know, f uh, creating wealth and, and a decent life for people. But, you know, and then as soon as they take steps to achieve those ends, you know, every time as a, the state steps in to do something, some form of inequality is created. And, and so, you know, they don't realize, I mean, the single greatest cause of inequality in the United States is probably the, uh, I was going to say the state institution that is the Federal Reserve Bank, but it's not actually even a state institution, but you know what I mean. Yeah. And, you know, the greatest, if, if, if somebody wanted to uh, take a step to bringing greater equality in the, in the United States, they should just abolish the Fed. But, um, you know, so we all agree on the aims, but we don't agree. What, what the problem is, is the, is the methods. 
Well, and the I, means. yeah, and I, th- I think most of those people that come on TV and promise uh, promise they've got a way, you know, frankly, they're they're the, the, and they're also making promises that they can't possibly keep. Well, and they're look, their goal, their goal is not to really make these promises and act on them. Their goal is just to stay in the seat of power because they like lording over people. I mean, they, that's their real objective. I don't really, I think. Well, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> hey, here's here's my here, my last thing. I, I have one bone that I want to pick with you, so to speak. So yeah, I, and maybe it's not going to once we talk about it, maybe it's not going to be a bone. I detect in your book, even though we, you know, almost everything you address, I'm like, agree, 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 right on down the line until you kind of get to the, to the, I'm, maybe it's an overall feeling of like, there's a hopefulness. There's a hopefulness that, that this uh, ship can be turned, that, that, that the tide can uh, go the right direction, so to speak. Yeah. Do, do you really think though, that this state that has showed no signs of slowing in terms of growth do you really think there's ever going to be an opportunity for the state to uh, go to something like you're talking about, or or is it really more like, hey, this this beast is uh, is 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 out in the wild and it's on the loose and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and there's no there's no slowing of the growth. Well, I do think I do. I, I you know I, my depends which you know depends how I slept last night and how I wake up in the morning. You know, I have different opinions on different days and then so. Some days I look at the future and I see this never-ending expansion of the state, and and uh, I just think it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And you know, the bigger it grows, the more it needs to f- to feed itself. And you know, at some point, you know, that has to end. And what follows it, you know, that's the worrying question. But then, on the other hand, you see these huge, huge developments in the world of tech that are you know, many of them are just going to force good practice on the state. And of all those developments, in my opinion, the most exciting is Bitcoin, because if the state loses control of money, it is toast, um, because it is, it's only been able to expand in the way that it has because of its control of money. And suddenly, if people can make transactions with bitcoin between each other all those stealth taxes from the the hidden tax that is the devaluation of money through inflation to you know a 20 percent sales tax to a this and that they just become less possible and similarly the extortion of income tax if people are paid in bitcoins it just becomes that much harder and also the taxes that people have to pay if they're in a currency that's not the issuance of the state become that much more transparent to them and so people are uh, far less willing to pay taxes when they realize how much taxes are demand are demanded also we have in the uk a thing called you're taxed on your your you pay your income tax before you actually receive the money so you only actually receive your payment if you work for a company after you've paid tax on it whereas if you're paid in things like bitcoin it's going to be harder for the state to tax at source in that way so all the various forms of 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 revenue for the state are threatened, have the potential to dry up as a result of um, digital currency. And and so you can expect an almighty fight and everyone will say, oh, people who are dealing in Bitcoin, they're arms dealers and drugs dealers and um, they're trafficking, you know, prostitutes or something. All these wild accusations will fly about um, as the state you know, wages war on it. And you can already see, I mean, the guy from Bitcoin got arrested yesterday morning. And yet the guys from HSBC uh, who've been, who it appears have been funding terror, nothing. Yeah. And so, you know, you see the different p- priorities, wh- which, which groups the state is trying to stop and which they aren't. But if it loses control of money, then we're in the end game. But it, it, in my opinion, it all hinges on that. And it, so it, it could go either way, but it's, it's all about money. Yeah, you make a great point there. I, I, I think I sometimes worry, too, about the overall uh, perception of of populations in the sense that it seems like so many people are so preoccupied with uh, just going through the motions, you know, showing up at Walmart on a Saturday morning, eating some fast food, wash, rinse, repeat, that the the energy and enthusiasm to do something big, to think big, to, to be to stand outside the crowd, I think psychologically, they're too big. They're, yeah. instead of doing something big and thinking big, they're eating big. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, see now, see now, now I'm getting to the heart of the matter. This is why you've been paid the big money to be on stage over the years. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's true though. It's like, but I think people there's they're, they're you know even though there's a minority of people that understand what you just said about Bitcoin and how exciting that could be, there's also a majority that frankly I've been saying this recently that if the nipple breaks, people won't know where to suck. And, uh, yeah. you know, so it, it's That's a nice line. It's, <laughs> it's catch 22, you know, I mean, yeah, we want it to we want the system to have to to reset and go to a better operation. But I think there's so many people addicted to the system. What might they do if they don't have their uh, their nipple, so to speak? People are clever. They adapt. They'll just have to pull their socks up and it'll be good for them. <laughs> that, that, there you go. They will. I mean, and, 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 but the thing is, you know, what people don't realize is they people envisage without the state a period of hardship. And I would argue that it's the very opposite. There will be a huge boom. Everyone will be, you know, there'll be technological advances. People will have more money in their pockets. They'll be empowered by the fact that they've got more, more money in their pockets. They will be more able to ho- help those who can't help themselves. You know, it, it, it will be a richer, better world. So, so the idea that, you know, yes, people will have to pull their socks up, but all it, which will be good for them. But there will be more help, cheaper help, and better help available to them. You know, w- welfare. Th- th- the giving of charity is a is a delicate and unpredictable process, and sometimes simply giving people money helps but other times some people need something practical or they might need some something local or something psychological or something emotional or sometimes they just need a plane or kick up the backside different circumstances require different forms of care and how the state can hope to uh, come up with a top-down one-size-fits-all system uh, that works over time it's just a hopeless cause but whereas when suddenly you get rid of the state in charity and 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 people uh the responsibility to provide charity falls on individuals, uh, you will find much more varied, widespread, diverse, flexible, cheaper. You just find better charity, effectively. You'll find better welfare. Dominic, you're a keen observer of society, and uh, I think you do a service with your book, uh, Life After the State. I think. Can, can I ask you a question, sure. Michael? Fire away. Um, you know, I, I, I wrote the book, but I, I, I wrote it you know, a lot of the stats I use and the examples I use, particularly in the chapter about healthcare, are related to the UK. And as an American, did you, were you, because I know America is quite a kind of American centric country and there are a lot of people that forget that the, <laughs> there is a world beyond the, beyond the United States. But did you find it, w- was that interesting to you or do you think Americans will be uh, put off by that or do you think they'll be interested by it? I'll tell you why it was interesting is because I think what happens, and now mind you, I lived in Asia all last year. I'm in the States right now. But I think what's interesting about it is Americans do get very American centric and don't look outside their borders. I think what the one that really struck me was your conversation about Glasgow. And so I, th- oh, I, yeah. I think if Americans can start to realize. Uh, yeah. I mean, you could substitute that with Detroit there or you something go. just as a boom. And yeah. I think that that's helpful when, if you can spread your horizons and realize, Oh, hold on. We're not so unique with what we're doing with state expansion in America. It's been tried other places and they didn't exactly work well. Then you start to realize, hold on, there's nothing special about the politicians and their directions in America. It's the same old stuff they've done in other countries that that's very useful. Yeah, well, we're we're about fifty years ahead of you uh, on the on the road to to uh, you know on the, the the road of the road to state the road of state expansion. You know, we we because you really only started maybe after the Second World War, whereas we got started with the First World War. Or maybe you got started in the twenties, but but you know we're 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 definitely ahead of you. Uh, you know, I, now, we started joking around about this, but the thing is, with me, I've been sitting here for the last thirty days r- visiting family in the Washington D.C. area, so looking at the Washington Post for the first time in years, and and and, and the whole thing just like it feels like it was written by comedy writers. Uh, the head <laughs> the headlines, what they choose to talk about, and it's 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 just feels like propaganda i mean it's 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 almost it's you know where i'm coming from it's and i i just i just i just want to shake people and go this is nuts turn it all off it's crazy throw it away think for yourself (laughs) you know i uh i went to washington actually last year um and uh you know, we drove through the suburbs and amazed me. And we saw all these lovely houses and, 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 you know, it's a bo- 
boom area and then you realize the only reason it's booming is because they're all benefiting you know from the from the huge state spending that you have and then you kind of move elsewhere outside the kind of state bubble and uh, the reality of life is a lot more depressed yeah but you know i i think in until uh until some kind of a reset happens or something knocks knocks uh, a certain part of the population off their perch uh it, it, we're, we're going the state direction i know you want life after the state but i don't know i i think we're i think we're to get bigger a bigger state well we are but um we i mean the 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 example of rome is that it can go on for hundreds of years yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but the example of the soviet union is that it can all suddenly end very quickly this is true. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, it could go either way. Dominic, the book is Life After the State. Dominic Frisbee. Dominic, where is the best place for people to? They can go on Amazon and all that stuff, whatever country they're in, and check out the book. Where is the best place to find out more information about you online? Well, I mean, I have a website, DominicFrisbee.com, and there's also a website for the book, LifeAfterTheState.com. And if I can just plug something, um, you know, I'm very proud of the book, and you can buy it on Amazon. You can buy the Kindle version on Amazon. I don't even know if the the, uh, hardback version has come to the U.S. yet. But, um, you know, I've, I've done a lot of voiceovers over the years, and I've spent my life in a sound studio, and I'm very proud of the audio book of life after the state so if your listeners like um audio books and um you know you can listen to a lovely well-spoken englishman i know the english accent's very popular over there <laughs> uh, and they they make good listening in in your car but you can go to lifeafterthestate.com and just click on the audio book version and you can download the audio book there you just pay with paypal and uh um, you know, I think the audio book's pretty good. Or you can buy it on Audible, the, the Amazon audio book website as well. You know, as a guy that's written a bunch of books, did you record it yourself? I did. And, and uh, I went to the studio where I recorded my first ever voice tape when I was 22. I, I, I narrate a lot of documentaries and things like that for the BBC and National Geographic and other channels. So, you know, I'm, a, I'm an experienced voiceover artiste, and uh, I work with the best engineer in London on it. And so, you know, I'm I'm, I'm really pleased with the audio. How long did it take you to record it? Uh, it was about just a, just over two days. It was about two days in the morning. You we, you'd read you read for three hours, then you take a break, and then you read for another three hours, and then your brain is absolute mashed potato, uh, and you go to bed, and and then in the morning you're fresh again. But recording an audio book is a big undertaking. There's a lot of words to read. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank thank you for that. I was always curious. I've not really talked to anyone who's who's recorded one yet at one of their books yet. So I was curious. I've I've debated it myself, but I haven't pulled the trigger yet. Well, it's a good. I mean, you've got a good voice, and you're obviously used to working with audio, so it's worth doing. But it, it is an undertaking, and you need. I mean, I had a producer and a sound engineer, so we had six ears or three sets of ears listening to it, and. Uh, you know, so it, I wouldn't do it by yourself. I'd have, I'd, I'd make sure you have at least another set of ears. Well, I appreciate that advice. It, DominicFrisbee.com, Life After the State on Amazon, all around the world, on Kindle. Yeah, and LifeAfterTheState.com is, is the website for the book. Check it out. Hey, Dominic, hopefully we can talk again and uh, uh, maybe we will finally get to Life After the State. Then we'll, we'll, have, we'll have a beer over that. We <laughs> we will definitely and and uh, listen. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, to talk to you. Thanks, Dominic. We'll talk soon. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor protecting against a crash, or just trying to make a lot of money. Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.